Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. <music> Taliban says Afghan women will be stoned to death for adultery. <music> Political activists expose Pakistan's terror camps and human rights abuses in POK at UN. And Jammu and Kashmir police cracks down on overground workers to counter terrorism. In a recent development, the Taliban has issued a new edict imposing harsh penalties such as public flogging and stoning to death for women accused of adultery in Afghanistan. Despite initial promises of a more open and moderate rule after coming to power in 2021, the Taliban's actions have drawn parallels to their regime in the late 1990s. Over the past two years, Afghan women and girls have faced increasing exclusion from public life, including access to education and recreational spaces like parks and gyms. This come amid Afghanistan's deepening economic crisis and the looming threat of societal collapse. <laughs> The plight of women in Afghanistan is expected to get worse. In this audio message, the Taliban's supreme leader, Hebatullah Akhundzada, announced that the group would begin enforcing its interpretation of Sharia law in Afghanistan, including reintroducing the public flogging and stoning of women for adultery. The Taliban regime has vowed to start public stoning of women to death if they commit adultery. This announcement comes as no surprise as according to Afghan Witness, a research group monitoring human rights in Afghanistan, last year alone, the Taliban group ordered 417 public floggings and executions. So this new diktat hardly makes a difference. However, it shows that the Taliban have not changed and have returned to harsh punishments similar to those from the 1990s. They have made an announcement uh, by the head of the Taliban right now. So one has to look whether they are going to implement it or not. Uh, like in the case of women's education, even this year they have not allowed girls above the age of 12 to go to the schools. So this is at a level of announcement, we have to look at it. But definitely not much has changed in the Taliban as far as the ideology is concerned. And some of us were always of the view that the ideology, the orthodox understanding of Islam and interpretation of Sharia as per their own orthodox understanding was always there in, in Taliban. It has not changed much from Taliban 1 to Taliban 2. Taliban during their rule from 1996 to 2001 enforced a strict interpretation of Sharia law. Under the Taliban back then, women and girls were discriminated against in many ways for the crime of identifying as a girl. The women and girls of Afghanistan were banned from going to school or working. Healthcare was only accessible to them only when delivered by men. If a woman left the house, it was a full body whale, burqa, accompanied by a male relative. Women who suffered harassment and other forms of violence could end up being accused of moral crimes and adultery and risk being stoned to death as punishment. And Taliban 2.0 is no different than Taliban 1.0, as despite the claims made by Taliban to be moderate this time, once again, women and girls are erased from public and social life. Immediately after the Taliban took over in August 2021, women and girls took to the streets to protest, but were met with violence, arbitrary detention and even killed. Since the Taliban have been back in power, women and girls have been banned from attending secondary school or working or appearing on TV or even just going to a park. When they came, uh, one of the issues, as I said, that they wanted an international legitimacy. So they have to show that there is certain changes 
within Taliban or in their ideology. But we have seen over the years, uh, by the, the, the immediately after coming back, they have banned the girls' education, the women are not allowed to work, women are not allowed even to go out on their own. So they at least brought some of those earlier uh, laws that were there at that point of a time in 1996. Yes, uh, to show that they have changed, they have made certain kind of statements, but their statement has not matched their action. Over the past two decades, Afghanistan made significant strides in human rights, democracy, gender equality, education, healthcare and inclusivity. It served as a regional example with a thriving media landscape and open discourse. The literacy rate for women had increased from 17% in 2001 to 30% in 2021. The number of girls in school had increased from 2 million to 9 million and women held 27% of seats in the Afghan parliament. In the last 20 years, at least one thing that had happened in Afghanistan was women's right. Women were in the parliament, women were in the university, women were working. Now you cannot, and this is proved all over the world, that you cannot keep women inside and you think that your society will develop. If you, if you debar them from schools and universities, then you are debarring at least half of your population. And this is realized by all over the world. So Afghanistan, by doing this kind of a thing, it's not only hampering its economic development, but also the social development of Afghan society in the long run. However, since August 15, 2021, uncertainty has prevailed, raising fears of human rights violations for activists, former government employees, women and minorities, as highlighted in a recent UNEMA report detailing over 50 degrees curtailing women's freedoms. According to the report, there has been an increase in police harassment in public spaces and further limited women's ability to leave their homes. 57% women in Afghanistan feel unsafe leaving the home without a mehram or male guardian. Today, Afghanistan is the only country where girls are banned from going to schools. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to the UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finished secondary school and entered the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least 5.4 billion US dollars. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. We are now shifting our focus to Geneva, where political activists hailing from Pakistan-occupied Kashmir have levied accusations against Pakistan for harboring terrorists within the region. Speakers during the event also shed light on Pakistan's alleged human rights violations in the area, while also condemning the exploitation of natural resources, leading to substantial environmental degradation. Pakistan has been accused of providing refuge to terrorists in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, a region that has been under its forceful occupation for decades. The United Kashmir People's National Party has brought forth allegations exposing Islamabad for allegedly operating terror camps in POK, violating human rights and exploiting natural resources in the region. These revelations surfaced during a side event titled Human Rights in Pakistan at the 55th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. During the event, activists also shed light on the presence of numerous terrorist training camps in POK, asserting that these facilities are utilized to train individuals who are subsequently dispatched for infiltration into Jammu and Kashmir, as well as neighboring Afghanistan. As we know that uh, there are more than 22 teenagers are 
forcibly taken by the extremist groups in Bagh Azad Kashmir for the purpose of jihad training. They will train them, they will send them to Afghanistan or Indian side of Kashmir. We were here to ask international community, United Nations to intervene to protect life, liberty and property of the Kashmiris who are living under Pakistani occupation. Beside allegations of sponsoring cross-border terrorism, Pakistan is facing criticism for its dire human rights track record. Decades of reports have detailed numerous violations in the Pakistan-occupied territories, including political repression, forced disappearances, torture, and restrictions on freedom of expression. International human rights organizations and advocacy groups have extensively documented these infringements in POK and Gilgit-Baltistan. Furthermore, the occupied territories struggle with socio-economic challenges such as poverty, unemployment, inflation and illiteracy. Activists at the UN event underscored limited access to education, inadequate infrastructure and insufficient healthcare services. Additionally, speakers accused Pakistan of exploiting natural resources from the occupied regions, resulting in significant environmental damage. We are facing forcibly deviations. We are facing religious hatred. We are facing draconian laws which imposed the government of Pakistan. Our, our natural resources is plundering. Our forest land is all allotted to the Pakistan army. Our all the tourist resorts in POK is now occupied by the Pakistan army and in the name of green tourism, again, the, the puppet government of Azad Kashmir is sold the land of the state of Jammu Kashmir. Since the illegal occupation by Pakistan, the people of POK and Gilgit-Baltistan have encountered persistent challenges. They assert that successive governments in Islamabad have denied them their rightful rights. Widespread protests have erupted in the region, highlighting issues such as power outages, inadequate education and unemployment. Activists from POK and Gilgit-Baltistan have consistently aired their grievances against Pakistan's alleged atrocities at international platforms, urging urgent intervention from the United Nations to safeguard their fundamental rights. Despite these efforts, the plight of the people in these occupied regions remains unresolved, prompting questions about the effectiveness of international intervention in addressing their grievances. Overground workers form a vital bone of terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, especially in the valley. The overground workers are eyes and ears of terrorists and therefore Indian security forces are focusing their attention on overground workers. The overground workers are the people who provide logistic support to the terrorists and assist them in their surreptitious movement. Though tracking overground workers is a huge challenge, security forces are planning best strategies amid changing dynamics of counter-terrorism in Kashmir. A report. In India's Jammu and Kashmir, three people have been detained on suspicion of receiving material deliveries from drones that crossed into Anya sector from Pakistani side. The suspects, Gulshan Naz, Imtiaz Shah and Abid Shah were identified by police as the overground workers and terror associates. Their homes were searched where digital evidence showing how they used to communicate with their handlers in Pakistan was found. Mohammad Qasim, a Lashkar-e-Taiba member and designated terrorist, has been identified as the handler of overground workers. Elitika, uh, uh, लीडर है मोहम्मद काशी और उसका नाम बहुत सारे प्रीवियस टेरर इंसिडेंट्स में रिफ्लेक्ट हो चुका है जो 
पिलीग्रिम्स की बस में जो ब्लास्ट हुआ था कटरा में इसमें मास्टर माइंड मोहम्मद कासिम था उसी की भेजे गए आईडी से ये ब्लास्ट हुआ था जो नरवाल में ब्लास्ट हुआ था पिछले दिनों में वो भी कासिम के प्लानिंग और एग्जीक्यूशन थी जम्मू एंड कश्मीर पुलिस हैव अनाउंस्ड अ बाउंटी ऑफ रुपीज टेन लाख ऑन कासिम अकॉर्डिंग टू पुलिस कासिम इज करेंटली बेस्ड इन पाकिस्तान Terrorists like Qasim often use advanced technology so that the communication remains undetected between them and overground workers. Last year, the government had blocked several mobile applications which were reportedly used by terrorists in Kashmir to communicate with their supporters and on-ground workers. Abhi tak ki investigation se humko ye pratit hota hai ki ye continuously koshish karte hain eh यंगस्टर्स को किसी ना किसी तरीके से इनको कांटेक्ट करके कुछ लालच कुछ प्रोपागंडा और कुछ मिलीजुली से इनको प्रलोभित करके इनको अपने दायरे में लाए ओवरग्राउंड वर्कर्स प्रोवाइड आर्म्ड ग्रुप्स लाइक हिजबुल मुजाहिदीन एंड जैश ए मोहम्मद इन जम्मू एंड कश्मीर विद लॉजिस्टिकल सपोर्ट कैश शेल्टर एंड अदर नेसेसरी इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर टू एनेबल देम टू ऑपरेट Overground workers are essential to terror attacks because they give tactical elements real-time information and support. Other roles that overground workers have taken on include stone pelting, mob writing, providing ideological support, radicalization and recruiting militants. Now let's shift our focus to Balochistan. a province in pakistan known for its wealth of natural resources however balochistan has besieged by numerous challenges ever since it was forcefully annexed by pakistan in 1948 the people in this region has faced atrocities at the hands of the pakistan army including extrajudicial killings enforced disappearances and custodial torture recently amidst the 55th session of the united nations human rights council Baloch Human Rights Council convened a side event in which several prominent speakers underscored various aspects of the hardships endured by the Baloch people in Pakistan. We have a report. For decades, the Baloch people have endured unimaginable suffering, trapped in the grip of poverty, unemployment, and illiteracy. Not only that, they have long been subjected to a systematic campaign of aggression by the Pakistani state involving military operations, enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings and a consistent denial of their basic human rights. A majority of Baloch who demand independence from Pakistan's forceful occupation are being targeted by Pakistani security forces. The activists and intellectuals are being kidnapped tortured and brutally killed despite pleas for intervention the united nations has yet to send a fact finding mission to investigate these atrocities however during the ongoing 55th session of the un human rights council a side event was hosted by the general secretary of the baloch human rights council in which several featured speakers shed light on various aspects of the atrocities faced by the baloch people in pakistan we at uh, the baloch human rights council uh, had organized a side event at the united nations uh, the purpose of the event was to bring together representatives of various oppressed nations in pakistan to discuss and uh, share their experiences and uh, sufferings of the uh, human rights violations facing the oppressed nations uh, and uh, the violations of human rights and human uh, human rights uh, laws uh, by the pakistani authorities there has been an alarming increase in number of enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings in balochistan so as uh, uh, documented uh, uh, the data collected by the baloch human rights council about 506 individuals were subjected to enforced disappearances uh, in last year 
and about 47 of uh, those forcibly disappeared persons were extrajudicially killed by Pakistani authorities. In the name of mega projects, our Baloch activists are urging the international authorities to take action on the ongoing genocide of their community members. They are demanding the United Nations and human rights organizations to take action and hold the authorities accountable for the crimes committed in Balochistan. Over the years, thousands of people have vanished in Balochistan as a result of a brutal crackdown led by the military. Global media outlets have time and again highlighted the discovery of hundreds of bodies of suspected armed separatists and political activists in Balochistan province, pointing to extrajudicial killings by Pakistani security forces. According to a recent report by PANK, the Human Rights Department of Baloch National Movement, there have been 33 enforced disappearances, 28 torture victims, and five extrajudicial killings in February 2024. It is a tool by the Pakistani state to silence the oppressed people of the poor province. Activists want a fact-finding mission headed by the United Nations Working Group to investigate the matter. We came to the United Nations today to raise the issue of human rights violation in Pakistan. Uh, we believe the United Nations has a responsibility towards the suffering people of Balochistan. So we came to uh, raise the, our voices and tell the United Nations that, of course, you have a lot of issue in the world, but we see uh, they sometimes show that the excuse of and territorial integrity of other, other state, but when it comes to the big power, they don't care if they have any meaning for the territorial integrity rules. We, uh, we understand, we believe they have right to protect their, uh, their, their interest, but at the same time, they have the huge and great responsibility towards suffering people. And they cannot turn a blind eye uh, to the rogue regime where they are committing uh, heinous crimes such as genocide and a crime against humanity. The Baloch are suffering both socially and financially. A large number of them who have migrated to other countries for their safety are now demanding the United Nations and other human rights organizations to protect the Baloch identity. They have high hopes from the international community as they continue to fight against repressive policies of Pakistan. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.